Welcome to Music History Monday for May 2nd, 2021. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Giacomo Meyerbeer and French Pop Up, a term to be defined in due time. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music, where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the death on May 2nd, 1864, 158 years ago today, of the German-born opera composer Jakob Liebmann Beer, also known as Giacomo Meyerbeer. Born in Berlin on September 5, 1791, he died in Paris during the rehearsals for the premiere of his opera L'Africaine, the African, which turned out to be, no surprise then, his final opera. Let us get to know Herr slash Signore slash Monsieur Meyerbeer a bit, even as we explore the tremendous popularity of his operas, the reasons behind that popularity, and the reasons for their fall from popularity. No exaggeration, as popular as Elvis. Incredible, though it may seem to us here today, Meyerbeer was the Elvis Presley of 19th century opera. Not that he was a pelvis gyrating, groupy groping rock star, as we understand a rock star to be today, no, but in the world of 19th century opera, he was the most popular musician of not just his time, but of his century, the single most frequently performed opera composer of the 19th century. In terms of his singular international fame and his income, Meyerbeer was more than Gioacchino Rossini, more than Giuseppe Verdi, more than Richard Wagner, the most successful stage composer of the 19th century. Meyerbeer's impact was not limited to the opera-going public. Au contraire, his operas were stunningly influential as well writes David Salazar, quote, Such noted composers as Verdi, Wagner, Berlioz, Massenet, Donizetti, Halevi, Dvorak, Rimsky-Korsakov, Tchaikovsky, Gounod, Liszt, and Chopin, among others, all came under Meyerbeer's spell at one point or another in their respective careers, unquote. And yet, yet, here today, we would observe the sad truth. Meyerbeer's operas are almost entirely unknown, a fall from artistic grace almost without equal in the history of Western music. An international career. Moments ago, I referred to Meyerbeer as Herr slash Signore slash Monsieur Meyerbeer. This was not an act of linguistic flippancy on my part. In fact, Meyerbeer experienced tremendous success as a composer of opera in what today are three different countries and in three different languages, in Germany, Italy, and France, in German, Italian, and French. He was born into one of the most illustrious families in Berlin's Jewish society, an excessively small but distinguished group of bankers and industrialists. His father was a wealthy financier named Judah Herz Beer, 1769-1825, and his mother, Amelie Beer, born Wolf, was a highly cultured woman who likewise came from Berlin's moneyed elite. Trained as a pianist from the youngest age, by 11, young Jakob Beer was a successful performing prodigy. In 1810, at the age of 19, he left home to study with the Abbe George Joseph Vogler, 1749-1814, in the Hessian city of Darmstadt. It was there in Darmstadt that he met and began what were lifelong friendships with Vogler's other students, who included Karl Maria von Weber, 
1786 to 1826, who would revolutionize, not too strong a word, who would revolutionize German language opera in 1821 with Der Freischutz. I would tell you that in 1815, Weber described Meyerbeer as, and we quote, one of the best pianists, if not the best pianist of our time, unquote. By the way, for our information, it was in 1810, with his arrival in Darmstadt, that Meyerbeer combined Meyer, a family name on his mother's side, with his father's surname of Beer to create Meyerbeer. Between 1816 and 1825, he lived, studied, and composed operas primarily in Italy, garnering great fame in the process, which was most unusual for a non-Italian composer. Oh yeah, the dude also garnered a new first name in a process described by Matthias Brolska in the New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians. We quote, in gratitude to the country to which he owed his career, he began to use the Italian form of his first name, Giacomo, unquote. As early as 1823, the Paris Opera, at the time the most prestigious house in the world, approached Meyerbeer and inquired as to whether he would be interested in composing for the French stage. The eventual answer was, we. Oui. And on January 1st, 1827, Meyerbeer began working on Robert the Diable, Robert the Devil, no reference to what I was called by former girlfriends and students. Finally premiered at the Opera on November 21st, 1831, Robert le Diable was a gigantic hit. Frederick Chopin, 1810 to 1849, who was at the premiere, wrote, quote, If ever magnificence was seen in the theater, I doubt that it reached the level of splendor shown in Robert. It is a masterpiece. Meyerbeer has made himself immortal. Yeah, that's quite a review. And Chopin was not alone in his enthusiasm. Meyerbeer's operas were performed across Europe, and they were SRO, that's standing room only, wherever they played. Working with the French dramatist and librettist Eugène Scribe, 1791 to 1861, Meyerbeer virtually created a new genre of opera, alternately called Paris opera or grand opera. These were operas engineered specifically to appeal to the new middle-class opera audience that had replaced the nobility in the post-revolutionary age as the essential patrons of the Paris opera. Like aristocratic French opera of the pre-revolutionary years, pre-1789, these grand operas celebrated heroic characters and exaggerated, often to the point of cartoonish, dramatic situations, delivered in magnificent displays of solo singing, choral singing, and orchestral grandiosity. Like aristocratic French opera of the pre-revolutionary years, these grand operas included lengthy dance sequences called ballets and featured spectacular sets and costumes. However, grand opera significantly dumbed down slash simplified the stories being told relative to aristocratic French opera. They featured huge crowd scenes with all sorts of moving parts, and they typically were set in five acts with four extended intermissions during which the audience could get properly sloshed. Meyerbeer's spectacular fame went to his head, and like certain professional athletes of our time, he began speaking of himself in the third person. So goes the famous story that he shouted at a barking dog, quote, Quiet! Meyerbeer is working! Unquote. So many Meyerbeer stories, so little time. Here are a couple pulled from the literature. Quote, Meyerbeer couldn't work, 
A street musician was playing a barrel organ in the street, just outside the window of the study. Worse yet, he was grinding out nothing but music by his operatic competitor, Rossini. Aiming a servant at the disturbance, Meyerbeer offered two francs if the nuisance would go play somewhere else. No, wait! Oh, how droll of me, Meyerbeer must have thought. Four francs if the nuisance would go play Meyerbeer's tunes in front of Rossini's house. A moment later, the servant returned. I'm sorry, monsieur. The organ grinder says no. No? To four francs? He says Rossini gave him eight francs to bother you. Unquote. One more. Quote, Strolling through Paris with a friend, Rossini ran into Meyerbeer, who asked after his health. Rossini cited a string of physical calamities. Meyerbeer expressed all due sympathy and moved on. Having just heard this litany of infirmity, Rossini's friend then urged Rossini to speed home to bed. My dear fellow, I feel perfectly fine. Rossini said, but it so cheers our friend Meyerbeer to think that I'm at death's door that I hadn't the heart to disappoint him." Unquote. In fact, the great Giacchino Rossini, 1792-1868, who had moved to Paris in 1824, was disgusted by the operas Meyerbeer and his librettist Eugene Scriba created for the Paris opera. For himself, Scriba was so prolific that even in his lifetime he came to be considered not so much a writer as, quote, a libretto factory, unquote. Reacting to the sensationalism and novelty for novelty's own sake in Meyerbeer's and Scriba's operas, Rossini observed, quote, I am only a composer. They are businessmen, unquote. The music writer Ethan Morden agrees, quote, a businessman. So Meyerbeer was regarded by the art world. The ballet of defrocked nuns in Robert le Diable, or the skating ballet in Le Prophète, the stodgy processions and endless set pieces, the double choruses one against the other in counterplay, seemed to some a vulgar carnival. Effects! without causes, was Richard Wagner's judgment." Unquote. Dancing nuns and biblical prophets on roller skates? This sounds uncomfortably like the musical extravaganzas of Andrew Lloyd Webber, born 1948, who will, like Meyerbeer before him, go down as the most financially successful music theater composer of his time. Unfortunately, like Meyerbeer before him, history is not likely to be kind to Andrew Lloyd Webber's music, which is, let us charitably say, artistically suspect. Altogether, Meyerbeer composed 19 operas, five in German, eight in Italian, and six in French. Of those six French language operas, four are considered to be grand operas, Robert Le Diable of 1831, Les Huguenots of 1836, La Prophète of 1849, and L'Africain of 1865. Given their tremendous contemporary popularity, but in the end, their less than lasting artistic content, I'm going to suggest a terminological designation rather less grand, but frankly more accurate than grand opera. French popular opera, shortened to French pop-op. Calling Meyerbeer's most successful works pop-ops might help us to verbally frame his success as well as his incredible fall from popular grace, of which there is no parallel in opera history since the invention of modern opera by Christoph Willibald Gluck in the 1750s. Felix Mendelssohn, 1809 to 1847, 
identified the critical problem with Meyerbeer's work in Meyerbeer's lifetime. To quote Mendelssohn, melodies for whistling, harmony for the educated, instrumentation for the Germans, contradances for the French, something for everybody. But there's no heart in it, unquote. Yeah, Mendelssohn has identified Meyerbeer's work as being a homogenized operatic product, a manufactured commodity to suit the tastes and pretenses of its time, but one lacking the artistic legs to carry it into our time and beyond. Back to Frédéric Chopin. Earlier in this post, we noted Chopin's stunned reaction to the premiere of Meyerbeer's first grand opera slash pop-op, Robert Le Diable. Quote, if ever magnificence was seen in the theater, I doubt that it reached the level of splendor shown in Robert. It is a masterpiece. Meyerbeer has made himself immortal, unquote. Even though he had just recently arrived in Paris, and was only 21 years old when he wrote those words, we are honor-bound to observe that Chopin was no young pushover at that age, but rather an exacting and an accomplished professional with a malicious wit and a highly developed degree of critical acumen. And he wasn't the only high-end professional who believed that Meyerbeer's first pop-op was something really special. The composer, musicologist, and most influential critic, Francois Joseph Fetti, 1784 to 1871, was equally swept away by Robert, writing, quote, Robert le Diable is not only a masterpiece, it is also a remarkable work within the history of music. It seems to me to unite all the qualities needed to establish a composer's reputation unshakably, unquote. Hector Berlioz, whose own symphony Fantastique had received its own sensational and controversial premiere just a year before, in 1830, wrote on hearing Robert, quote, Robert le Diable provides the most astonishing example of the power of instrumentation when applied to dramatic music a power of recent introduction which has achieved its fullest development in the hands of Monsieur Meyerbeer, a conquest of modern art which even the Italians will have to acknowledge in order to prop up as best they can their miserable operatic system which is collapsing in ruins." Unquote. <laughs> Berlioz's low opinion of contemporary Italian opera aside, he clearly believed he was witnessing something new in Robert Le Diable. We cannot fault Chopin, Fetti, or Berlioz for being so swept away by Meyerbeer's opera because their enthusiasm was a matter of time and place. Despite the fact that the music had been composed by a Jew from Berlin, Robert Le Diable was a modern manifestation of what many feared was a lost French tradition, a tradition of magnificence in opera, a magnificence that was seen as nothing less than a reflection of the magnificence of the French nation itself. A parenthetical observation. French culture and Parisian society are and have long been notorious for their dismissive insularity and snobbishness towards anything not of French origin. It is no small irony then that for 200 plus years, French opera was defined by three foreign born composers. The Italian Jean Baptiste Lully, born Giovanni Battista Lully, 1632 to 1687, who was Louis XIV's chief court composer, virtually invented French court opera as we understand it today. Christophe Willibald Gluck, 1714 to 1787, whose work represented the rebirth of French opera in the mid 18th century, was born in Bavaria in Germany and raised in Bohemia in today's Czech Republic. And of course, Giacomo Meyerbeer, 
also known as Jakob Liebman Beer, was born and raised in Berlin. More than anything else, it was artistic politics and entertainment value that made Meyerbeer's grand operas so phenomenally popular in the 19th century. But lacking intrinsic literary and musical value, they have, for the most part, fallen from the stage, likely never to return. We await a Meyerbeer revival to prove me wrong. Thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.